In this podcast episode, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Richard Tyler, who as well as being a dad, is also a best-selling author, an international speaker, and has played the lead in a number of West End shows. Amongst other things, he talks about how he communicated to his daughter when he found out he had a rare type of cancer that if not treated, could mean he only had months to live, and how he thinks we can effectively support our children emotionally. Dad Mind Matters, helping men to safely navigate family life without losing their minds. Lived experience podcasts about mental health, parenting and marriage on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday. I can't imagine what you've been through in the past couple of years. And I think being a parent gives a whole new dimension to anything you're going through. And I think that's why a lot of dads are really struggling at the moment is because the there's a sense that we want to provide and I felt I've struggled when I feel like I'm not providing and I can only imagine the mental and physical battles you've been through and one of the reasons I thought well when I researched I think you'd be a fantastic guest is because what I really want to do with this podcast is show I suppose everyone but specifically dad because I think that's a demographic that is quite marginalized you're not alone because I'm sure there are lots of men living lives of silent desperation. You're not alone. And by, by talking to people like you who have done inspiring things and brave things and overcome things, I think that to me is really exciting because you never know how you will affect someone. Sadly, people don't say things enough. The number of people who will watch something and be inspired or moved and they could quite easily, they might like it with a thumbs up, but they could write you a sentence. And every now and again, you get a lovely sentence when someone does something and it makes such a difference because there are lots of men like you doing amazing things and it is inspiring. And I think men need to hear it from other men. Yes, you're, you're so right, James. I read something the other day, uh, an, uh, an American article about, let's call them mature masculine men, developed men running workshops and gatherings for adolescent boys. And the, the, one of the statements that stood out to me is that, you know, these, our future generation of men can't be what they can't see. And to me, that really resonated about, you talk about providing, and we often think of the first thing we think of when we think about providing, we think about providing the, the finances for us to be able to live. You talked about paying a mortgage. And that provision, of course, is so important to us. And then there are all these other ways of how do we provide? And do we provide love? Do we provide safety? And do we provide this really firm holding? Our children so desperately need now because the, the world generally is not offering the same sense of firm holding that perhaps maybe you and I grew up with. I think I'm, I think I'm a little bit older than you maybe, but I think about the, the firm holding that maybe we grew up with or perhaps took for granted yeah. that our children so desperately need to be provided for them. But this idea of we can't be what we can't see. So I absolutely adore what you're doing and what your hopes are for this podcast and what you're standing for, because actually it's about modeling to the rest of society and especially about how do we the heart and minds of young boys who are growing up still in this patriarchal way of being and how are we offering them a different lens how are we showing them a different way and we have to make that very visible and we have to make it very overt because unfortunately there are a lot i think models for them which are also very overt which are perhaps more an, an immature group yeah. and, an, and an unhelpful and unhealthy group so actually for people like you to stand up and say, we have to make ourselves vulnerable, our, our, the beauty of us and the ugliness of us, we would make visible and we have to demonstrate it. We have to show up and we have to be consistent. I, I, I admire you for doing that and because really I think it's, because I think it's really, I think it's really hard and I think it's really brave what you're doing. You talk about me being inspiring and brave and I have a little internal flinch every time you say because i go well, i think i'm either of those things i think i i, I think i'm think, holding yeah, enormous I, I duty to my to my daughter which was i guess a large part of the diagnosis came of you know yeah, 
actually, fuck, how do I go out of and tell a 16 year old that my dad's got stage four cancer? How do I start to have that conversation? She's ADHD. She's high functioning on the autism spectrum. So she processes in a very different way to me. And there's me sitting with this, having been told that morning, I have to start chemotherapy the next day that I have a very rare cancer. The, the timeline really prognosis for that type of cancer that is incurable in three to five years, but I'm 49 at the time and really you're quite healthy. And so really you should be okay. It will still be incurable. You're always up. You'll always be under the care of over an oncology team. So I'm sitting with this and then I know that I need to sit with a 16 year old and provide something. Provide something. What the fuck do you provide for a 16 year old who you, you know doesn't process in a way that what we might think is more, a more normative way of processing? And knowing that actually, as a self employed person, I won't be able to provide in the way that I used to provide. I won't be able to do that. I won't be able to provide what you're used to me providing without even batting an eyelid. I will continue to provide as much kindness and love and compassion and honesty and truth with you that I can, you will always be the first to know what is going on with my health before anyone else knows. No one else will know until you know. And I needed to do some deals with that felt like we could start this path together, this collective path we were walking with my wife and Mia, but also these individual paths that we were walking. We had to walk our own path and Mia had to walk her own path and still has to. And we walk this collective one, but I think the word provision is written is a really interesting one because we can get locked into what we think are the most important elements and mean we are not important. Sometimes we lose, I often describe as the sense of, do we crouch down next to another? Uh, I, I remember a teacher when I was primary school called Mrs. King. She was actually the only teacher that did it. But I remember I would struggle with especially struggle with Matt and she would be the only teacher who would crouch down right next to me. She would come to my eye line. And it's like it, in that moment that she did that, she would step in and occupy this space with me where there would be this kind of co-created collaborative space. And that's always struck me yeah. how in life would I be the one who crouches down to another and a terror. That's ultimately what our calling to provide is. Down. And I like that, that example, because I think actually what people who are struggling in any facet need is you in the trenches with them, whether that's your partner, whether that's your children, they don't, they don't necessarily want to fix it. They want you to be there, give them a space where it's completely non-judgmental and they can just be really open and vulnerable about what it is they're going through. That's quite a difficult thing to do. And that's, it's, it's difficult, especially from a parent. Sometimes needing some reassurance from your children. We're like, well, is that appropriate as a parent? But sometimes I can't possibly imagine how you had that conversation with your daughter. That to me was, just seems like an impossibility. I don't know how I would even broach that subject. Yeah, I, I, part of me goes, I don't know, which isn't really helpful, but the part of me that was faced that day with, there was no choice but to have this conversation, however clunky or emotional or overly emotional it might be. And I'm still coming to understand to me when he's 90, I'm still working out the ways in which I best communicate with her. And I'm still working out my own disappointment when perhaps she doesn't greet me in the way I want them to greet me. And I'm reminded way of relationships, physical touch, there's loads of elements in there that are, that are very complex. And I remember that moment of sitting there and she sat and she listened, I wanted to be very honest with her. The added complexity is that her mother and I are divorced and my wife, Kelly, who has been together for just 10 years. So there's a complexity in there of me was there and we obviously invited her mother to come and be a part of the conversation because she also needed to know what was happening. So Mia in some ways was right in the middle of this kind of three adults and her in the room and she sat and she listened and she asked a couple of questions and then that conversation with her was done. She went off to her room and she does 
processing the way Mia does processing, which is to put some music on, sing really loud, so to get lost in her music is a way of her being able to express and discharge. I've been endeavoured to give her that space all along to help her know that every question is okay. I might not always have an answer. And I hope that even in the moments where I have felt my most unwell, where I felt mighty unwell and the moments where actually I thought it was just all a bit too much to take, but if someone had have offered me the choice to, to exit stage left there and then I would have taken that because the treatment was brutal and so I had to make it okay for myself to go, I need some things from me. And we talked about, is it right? Actually, we have some needs of our children that we want them to listen to yeah. us or be there for us. Or, and, I, and I think I, I go right hundred percent because that's about a relationship. That's what healthy relationships are based on that, that input and our ability to fill up and love, hopefully good things and love yeah. and kindness and but also to be able to empty out and to be able to discharge and to be able to place it down. And that doesn't mean that the other person has to pick it up, but that the other person can be a witness to it. And I've wanted Mia to see that. Her mother has some slightly different views and has tended to stay, play the role of it's too much for Mia. And I say, let's let Mia make a decision about, she doesn't have to carry this. It's not like we give it to her and she puts it in her rucksack and she needs to carry it around for the day. Between us, we place it down on the ground and we choose which bits we pick up by being an, uh, kind of liking it to with an airport family holiday. We're always carrying lots of things. We've got a ruck and a cuddly toy stuck under one arm and part tucked under our ear and a mobile phone in our pocket and pulling cases and a child under one arm. And at some points, we have to put some things down and we have to reconfigure how we're doing this journey. Yeah. We go, we put the passport away now. We can throw that bag in the bin because you beat put that cuddly toy in the rucksack, we have to reconfigure and that we all play a part in that. So from a family dynamic, I'm kind of okay with going, there are times where I need me to be a support and a witness to my stuff. Whether she will be on that is different. So that bit I don't control. My vulnerability to say I need it or I would like it. Yeah actually feels okay. The problem is when we stop attuning and we stop noticing and we stop paying attention and we stop listening and we do something on autopilot or we do it because our, our needs are not being met in other relationships. And then the child, and I've seen this a lot in my therapy clinic where people will come and actually what they've done is make their child almost into their partner. So they are perhaps a single parent and the child has become the equal. And then I think that's quite problematic because I think we lose some balance and we lose that part of the relationship, which is the unconditional firm holding that we, that actually we have as parents, as elders to our children. Yeah. It's getting that balance, isn't it? Of, you're right. Any relationship you have with your children, there needs to be equal support, but it needs to be appropriate. There isn't a rule around what's appropriate or inappropriate. No. Time, but it's about how much is too much or not enough. And I think it's about our ability as parents just to keep listening. The need for us actually to stay attuned and to be the provider present, be the provider of crouching down. Even if we haven't earned enough money that week to take them to the cinema, we can't provide that bit, but we can provide the bit, which is the unconditional element of saying, whenever you need me to crouch down next to you, I will be crouched down next. I really agree with, and I think it's a really articulate way of putting it in actually when your parents aren't there anymore, that's the stuff you miss. That's the stuff that, that presence, you don't remember the stuff you were given. You remember the conversations you had quite often when life was hard. I really hope you got something from this podcast. And if you're going through or have gone through a mental health issue and you found a way to make your life slightly easier and you want to share that story please contact me. And I know it's a massive ask because no one's got any spare time, but I'm really trying to get this podcast out there. So if you have two minutes to leave me a review on Apple Podcast or Spotify, that would be hugely appreciated. I hope wherever you are in the world, you're okay. Take care of yourself. My book, First Time Dad, A 42-Week Guide to Pregnancy, is available in Kindle and paperback form on Amazon and an audiobook form on Audible. To sign up for my monthly newsletter, please visit my website, www 
at dadmindmatters.com.